Okay, so, well, uh, you can start sharing the screen, Rafael. So it, mm -hmm. it's a great pleasure to have with us Rafael Tinoraj. And um, uh, Rafael, it's French, but he loves Brazil. He did, uh, <laughs> he did his studies in, in Paris at uh, Orsay et Iria, Cicli. And now he's doing a postdoc in, at FGV in Rio. And he works uh, at the boundary of many application. He loves mathematics and in particular topology, algebraic topology. And he specialized since few years in topological data analysis. He gave wonderful courses. These were we all learning from him. So I'm sure this will be as good as the other. Please, Rafael. Thank you, Stefanella. I have one, one hour, right? Yes. This lesson. Yes. All right. Let me put an alarm. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to present uh, uh, this uh, course about uh, TDA, topological data analysis. Uh, so that's a, quite a new theory. Uh, um, that takes its roots into uh, in uh, algebraic topology, right? The idea is to apply uh, uh, common ideas of algebraic topology from the last century, uh, apply these, these ideas to um, data analysis. Um, so in these four lessons, this will be mostly mathematics that I will present, um, but I try to put a few uh, uh, concrete data analysis problems uh, uh, as often as possible. And we will actually start with uh, a few examples uh, to motivate and in introduce the, the, the philosophy uh, behind this theory. Uh, the first example comes from chemistry uh, 30 years ago. Uh, there is an important question in, in uh, chemistry. That is uh, the conformation space of uh, molecules um, the conformation of a molecule, uh, could say configuration, is the spatial uh, configuration it has, because each atom of the molecule has some degree of liberty, right? But because of the physical forces, not every position is possible. Uh, so in this paper, they studied this uh, famous cyclooctane molecule. Uh, it's a molecule made of eight atoms of uh, carbon and 16 of hydrogen. Uh, in order to understand uh, the possible configurations of um, the molecules, they did the following. They tried to uh, record the uh, spa spatial position of each uh, atom. Uh, so this molecule contains 24 atoms, and each one has three Euclidean coordinates, right? So you get, in the end, from a molecule, uh, 3 times 24. Uh, with uh, 72 coordinates. So that's a point in R72. So what they do, uh, they take a lot of molecules and they transform all these molecules into the corresponding points in R72. By doing that, what you get in the end is a, a, a bunch of points. We say a point cloud. I think it's fine. Yes, yes. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so you obtain from a bunch of molecules a bunch of points. And the third, try to study the shape of uh, this point cloud. And what they discovered is that it's not any random point cloud. It's actually a point cloud that is very close to a shape. And this shape is uh, the union of a sphere here and a Klein bottle uh, embedded in this high dimensional space. And actually, you can map uh, properties of the molecules with the, their position in, in, the, in this uh, configuration space. Uh, molecules being at the intersection of the, the, the Klein bottle and the sphere being um, critical uh, configurations of these molecules. Uh, by the way, if you have any question, any comment, please interrupt me. 
I would be happy to, to answer. Uh, another example from biology. Um, so we have in our brain uh, what is called uh, grid cells. Uh, there are special neural cells that have been studied a lot uh, lately. Uh, these cells uh, are responsible uh, for our um, understanding visualization, spatial visualization of what is in front of us. And so there is this idea that uh, um, what we see, what we observed, is encoded in uh, these grid cells and then kind of uh, create a map of, of what we see. And that they had this idea that the grid cells, the, the <coughs> The, 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 the way they uh, interact should uh, have a torus structure, right? Uh, in order to observe that, uh, they did this very nice experiment. So you will uh, record the activity of a lot of grid cells. Uh, to do that, you, you can use what is called the neuropixel. It's the technology that allows to record one cell at a time. You know, the neural cells, they emit spikes. So you have a bunch of time series, the, the activity of each, of each neuron. And by comparing these time series, you have a distance right between the grid cells. So you kind of create a, a, a matrix space, right? Uh, and they computed the topology of this space. And what they obtained uh, was a torus. A last example uh, from medicine. So this is about the uh, breast cancer, uh, a very complicated cancer with a lot of different uh, um, types. Uh, uh, it's not clear how, how we can category, categorize the different types of breast cancer. Uh, what they did here, kind of the same idea than the first example. They transformed each uh, patient uh, um, contaminated by breast cancer into a point, a vector here of 262 uh, coordinates. These coordinates being um, genomic uh, variables, that is uh, genetic information about the patient. So if you take one patient, you get one point. If you take a lot of patients, you get a lot of points. And they studied the topology of uh, this space. And uh, it ends up that this uh, point cloud so in R262, a lot of dimensions, has the shape of a tree. Uh, and actually, you can study further the structure of this tree. It has three distinct branches uh, where you can observe different kind of uh, breast cancer. And they discovered at the end of this branch a group uh, that was not known uh, at this time a group of patients that uh, synthesize uh, a particular molecule, uh, protein, CMYB+, and they have, they have the, the property that this group do not die from the cancer. They all survive. So they gave the name CMYB+, to this, this group. So uh, what I try to show here, uh, is that in TDA, uh, uh, what we try to do is understand the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, underlying topology of our uh, data set and hope to find some interesting uh, uh, information, some hidden structure behind it that will help us in our um, analysis. Um, from the theoretical part, <coughs> TDA, is uh, at the center of algebraic topology, computational geometry, and uh, data analysis. So what I will focus mainly uh, is uh, algebraic uh, topology in these four lessons. And this is the plan of uh, this mini course. Today, I will introduce uh, um, the main uh, objects of uh, topology and algebraic topology. Uh, in particular, topological invariance. These are um, what, what helps us uh, uh, <clears throat> understand topological spaces. Uh, in two days, I will introduce homology. Uh, 
which will be the, the stronger invariant uh, we'll use. Next week, we'll have to wait next week to talk about uh, persistent homology, right? Um, and then I propose a few uh, a Python programming session uh, altogether so we can uh, play with these ideas. Uh, all right. So uh, for today, let me introduce the main uh, protagonists of topology. I have uh, a few uh, historical recap. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the history of topology. So it's common to say that topology starts with uh, Euler in the 18th century. Um, if you understand topology as the theory uh, that studies uh, shapes that you are allowed to deform, right? Uh, this year, he published his famous uh, Konigsberg uh, um, bridge problem um, that is basically topology with graphs. Uh, a century later, you had Mobius that started to uh, study uh, surfaces. So uh, you can think about graphs as one dimensional shapes uh, and surfaces as two dimensional shapes, right? And in order to study this, surfaces, he introduced already some ideas of invariant. And then we had Riemann and Betty, kind of the same the same moment. They studied the same uh, uh, ideas of uh, topological invariants. Um, at this time, they talk about uh, uh, connected components, uh, um, genus, uh, Betty, he defined the Betty numbers, right? But we'll have to wait uh, the end of the century to have the first uh, uh, real formalization of uh, homology and homology groups, right? With Poincaré in this extremely famous paper. Um, so Poincaré defined homology, he defined uh, homotopy groups, and he had, he had this question about uh, uh, homology groups. Uh, he asked whether they were in strong enough to uh, uh, determine if a shape is a sphere or not. And this became the famous uh, Poincaré conjecture, right? Uh, that has been solved uh, a few years ago by um, Perelman. I mean, uh, not Perelman only, of course, it's a lot of mathematicians behind it, but he's been famous for this. All right. So what is topology about? The two main characters of topology are the topological spaces and the continuous maps. So uh, topological space, this is the, the, the biggest abstraction of the concept of space. Um, I won't treat the definition, but basically it's uh, a topological space is a, a set, a set of points with uh, an additional structure, a structure of uh, uh, neighbors, a structure of proximity. Um, once you have this abstract definition of topological space, you can also define abstractly what is a continuous map. Um, so the formalism involves uh, what are called uh, open sets. And you can see here that a, a, a map between two topological spaces, um, the definition of continuity can be expressed only with the notion of open set. Um, but for those who never saw that, it's not a problem because topology in this formalism already contains uh, the usual um, <clears throat> uh, epsilon delta topology we we, we study. Uh, when I talk about topological space, you can think of subsets of uh, Rn, the Euclidean space. Um, <clears throat> if you do so, then this definition, this mysterious definition of continuity, is equivalent the famous uh, epsilon delta definition of uh, that, that, that we all know, right? So um, let me explain how in practice we can uh, build topological uh, spaces. This will be the opportunity for me to introduce uh, important spaces. Uh, so as I said, you can define a topological space 
just as a subset of the Euclidean space. All right. So, for instance, in Rn, uh, I can define the unit sphere. This is a set of points at distance uh, one from the origin. <coughs> I can define the cube. So this is the same thing, but with the infinite norm. Open balls, closed balls. So um, you have a lot of subsets of Rn, right? And they do not admit a nice uh, um, algebraic description as those, right? So that will be uh, a problem for us. A topology will help us to study spaces that are not even nicely uh, uh, definable like this. So first possibility as a subspace of uh, the Euclidean space. Another way to build topological spaces is by gluing uh, together other topological spaces. So for instance, uh, here, I took two lines, two arcs, and I decided to glue the extra mark points, the two pairs of uh, uh, boundary points, right? So what does that give me? It gives me a circle. Two arcs glued, this is a circle. Actually, you can do it in any dimension, this uh, construction. If I take two disks, two hemispheres, and I glue the boundaries, I obtain a sphere, right? A two-dimensional sphere. I can do this for uh, the three-dimensional sphere also. If I take two balls, two closed balls, and I glue the boundaries, I obtain a three-dimensional sphere. So this is a bit harder to visualize because the three-dimensional sphere is, uh, we cannot see it in our three-dimensional space, right? But we can formally do, I mean, this is a nice way to, to see it. Uh, close to the notion of gluing is the notion of quotient. So basically a quotient will be a, a gluing of a space on itself. Here I took the famous example of the square. I take this square and I wish to quotient to glue the opposite side. All right. Uh, in topology, everything is uh, made of rubber. Everything is deformable. So uh, this uh, <clears throat> square, I can do like that, up, and glue the two opposite sides, and this gives me a cylinder, OK? I can go further. I wish to glue these two opposite sides, but also the other, the other pair of opposite sides. So I first glue the first pair. I get a cylinder. And then I have two uh, uh, boundary circles. That I want to glue one onto each other, onto the other. And if I do that, I can deform a little bit. And in the end, I get a torus. I hope this is clear. Interrupt me if not. Um, we can play a lot with this construction. What I can what I what I draw here is the square. I want to glue the opposite sides, but in the opposite uh, direction, in the opposite sense. So I take my square, and then I twist before I glue. And this gives me the Mobius band, right? If you want to glue again uh, the other pair in the same sense this time, what I get is a climb bottle. It's a bit harder to visualize, but it's possible. Uh, last uh, gluing that we can do on this square is I glue both pairs of opposite sides, uh, exchanging the sense uh, both times. Does anybody know what I obtain with this uh, construction? What famous topological space I get? Can I what take I a guess? Maybe. Sorry, so again? Can I take a guess, maybe? Yeah, please. Some type of, I don't know, projective uh, plane or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah, you get the projective plane. Thank you. No, thanks. All right. 
Um, so now our question is, uh, how do we do in topology to understand all these spaces? So as I said, the philosophy behind it is that um, everything is deformable, right? So what we try uh, is to define formally what is the deformation. And actually there are two common definitions <clears throat> we can use is the relation of homomorphism and the relation of homotopy equivalence. So this is what I will uh, introduce right now. I will start with homomorphism. The one I prefer is the relation of uh, homotopy equivalence and you will understand why later. Uh, let's start by comparing spaces with the uh, homomorphism. So I will use uh, in this course every, every time the same notations, uh, X and Y will be topological spaces. And I consider a map F that goes from X to Y. F is called a homomorphism if it is a bijection, it is continuous and its inverse is continuous. Okay, you could say that a uh, homomorphism is a um, bicontinuous bijection. If you can find, if there exists a homomorphism between two spaces, then we say that they are uh, homomorphic. Okay, here I gave an example. The unit circle in the plane and the square are homomorphic. How can I prove that? I have to define uh, homomorphism. And I took this very simple one. Each point of the circle, I map to the its projection onto the square, okay? So this is a well-defined bicontinuous bijection. And we conclude that they are uh, homomorphic. Actually, um, let, me, let me show you. It is a, a, a general property that um, the, the, the circle will be homomorphic to any, any closed loop, right? I can, I can deform things like that. The circle is also homomorphic to a triangle, right? It's not complicated to define a homomorphism like that. So what we are allowed to do with homomorphisms uh, are continuous deformations. The circle and the interval are not homomorphic. I cannot find a homomorphism between them. Why? Uh, it's not easy to prove. I will give you a proof of this uh, by the end of this uh, lesson. Um, but for you to get an idea, in order to, 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 to define a bijection first between the circle, a continuous bijection, and the circle and the interval, I will have to, to, to break the circle, right? I will have to, to open, to cut the, the, the circle. Uh, and this is not a continuous operation. The, this will not yield uh, homomorphism in the end. Uh, last example is this very um, uh, beautiful theorem of uh, Bauer that says that uh, the Euclidean spaces Rn and Rm uh, are homomorphic if and only if uh, the dimension the dimensions agree and if and only if n equals to m so in particular the plane here is not homomorphic to the real line okay oh yeah no the uh, another example uh, classification of surfaces as i said uh, already uh, studied by mobius um, if you take uh, an orientable surface, you can show that this surface uh, up to the... Yeah. You can show that this surface up to deformation is homomorphic to one uh, surface of this list. And this list is uh, indexed by what is called the genus, right? The sphere has genus zero, the torus has genus one, the bitorus has genus two, etc. All right. And so 
what do we do? Now we have uh, this relation. This relation of being homomorphic is an equivalence relation. So we can consider the quotient set. We can consider the equivalence classes of this relation. Uh, what is an equivalence class? For instance, what is the equivalence class of the circle? It is the set of all the spaces homomorphic to the circle. So I have the circle. I have the square that is homomorphic to it. We've seen it. The triangle, this polygon, any polygon actually, I will put in this class all spaces homomorphic to the circle. We have also uh, the class of the, the lines, the intervals. We've seen before that the circle is not homomorphic to the line, right? So these uh, classes are disjoint. We have the class of crosses, class of spheres. I mean, there's an infinite number of classes, of course, uh, of, of equivalence. An important question here, uh, when we write a list like that, is to verify that the classes are actually uh, um, not the same. Uh, and this is not um, this is not a simple question. The aim of algebraic topology is to give tools to study this kind of uh, this kind of questions. And the main tool we use is invariant. But before that, I'd like to talk about our second um, relation. Uh, between uh, topological spaces. And this is the equivalence of homotopy. First, I have to define what is a homotopy between uh, maps. I have, uh, again, two topological spaces, X and Y, and this time two maps, two continuous maps, uh, FG from X to Y. A homotopy between F and G is a map a big F like that, that goes from the product of X and zero one uh, and goes into Y. You can think of zero one, the interval as the time. If you take time equals to zero, uh, then the restriction of this map must be equal to F. If you take time equals to one, then the restriction must be equal to G and the whole map uh, F must be continuous also. Um, if you can find a homotopy between two maps, you say that the maps are homotopic. So what does that mean? It's simply a, a, a continuous interpolation between F and G, right? For instance, here I took the, the map F, this is a zero map from R to R. Uh, here is uh, this uh, G sinusoidal, kind of map uh, like this. And my homotopy, you see, it's simply uh, uh, this uh, linear interpolation between, uh, between F and G. Let me give you another example. Uh, the map F now is a map from S1, the circle, to the plane. Uh, and this is simply the usual the, the, the embedding the, 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 of the circle seen as a subset of the plane, right? And my second map, G, is also a embedding of the circle, uh, but translated, right? Now the center of the circle is the point two, two. And I can define a very simple homotopy between F and G, simply this uh, translation, right? You have this parameter T here between zero and one. And I say, the image of xt is cos theta plus 2t and sinus plus 2t. Uh, so as you may understand here, when the codomain uh, is uh, the Euclidean space, everybody is, is homotopic, actually, because you can do linear interpolations. It's interesting, the notion of homotopy, when the codomain is not trivial. Let me give you an example here. I consider the same maps, F and G, but now the codomain is, uh, I removed the origin, okay? It's R2 minus the point zero, zero. I use the same definitions of uh, F and G. And now 
uh, my homotopy is not well defined. Actually, don't have uh, homotopy between F and G because if you want to translate uh, this uh, circle uh, to the center 2, 2, you will have to cross this uh, point, but the point does not belong to the space, right? So it's impossible. It's not easy to prove that there is no homotopy between F and G in this space. You will need a few a few tools that we will uh, introduce later. Okay. And now I can talk about homotopies uh, between spaces. X and Y, our two topological spaces, a homotopy equivalence between X and Y will be a pair of maps. F and G, no F goes from X to Y, and G goes from Y to X. And I call this pair uh, homotopy equivalence if the composition uh, GF, so this is like this, so GF, it's a map from X to X, if this composition is homotopic to the identity map on X. And I also ask that the other composition that goes in this direction, FG, is uh, homotopic to the identity map on Y. Okay. This may look a bit mysterious, uh, this definition at first, but it's not. It really is a um, weaker form of uh, homomorphism. Because if you think about uh, uh, being homotopic as being equal, as being the same, then you just ask for the first composition to be the identity and the second composition to be the identity. And this is exactly the definition of a homomorphism, right? A homomorphism is a map F that admits an inverse, right? And when you have an inverse, then the composition are equal to the identity. Um, as a consequence of this observation, homomorphic topological spaces are homotopy equivalent, right? Being, ho being homomorphic is a stronger condition. Being uh, homotopy equivalent is a weaker condition than um, you know, So what actually happens with this uh, uh, homotopy equivalence? Uh, uh, with respect to the homotopy equivalence, we are allowed to deform the spaces, right? The circle is homotopy equivalent to the triangle. I, I mean, they are homomorphic, right? So they must be homotopic, homotopy equivalent also. Uh, but we can do more. What we can do is to retract uh, pieces of uh, our spaces. For instance, this circle with a, a little hair here, I can take the hair and retract it. And what I get is a circle. Same thing with this uh, analysis. If I take the analysis and I retract, right, all around onto the inner circle, then I obtain this circle. And all these spaces here are homotopy equivalent. Uh, the line, is homotopy equivalent to a point because I can up, retract it. The letter A uh, is homotopy equivalent to a triangle because I can take the, the legs of A and retract it. I cannot open, I cannot cut this, uh, this uh, triangle is not equivalent to a point. I will have to retract, it's not possible, right? Okay, so this was a lot of, of definitions. Um, but we can do the same as what we did with uh, homomorphism uh, equivalence. We can gather the spaces into uh, homotopic classes. Now the classes are wider, they are bigger, because given the space, you have more uh, homotopy equivalent topological spaces. For instance, 
in the homotopy equivalence class of the circles. I have the square, I have the circle, but I also have the letter Q. I have the annulus, I have deformed annulus, you know, a lot of spaces. The class of points now contains a lot of spaces. Uh, actually, all the spaces contained in this class are called contractible spaces. There are the spaces that you can contract on only one point. The class of spheres, the class of the torus, etc. So I have a little uh, exercise for you uh, to verify that it was clear enough what I explained. These are the letters of the uh, alphabet. Uh, I'd like you to classify the letters into homotopy equivalence classes, right? Gather the homotopy equivalent letters, and then you tell me uh, how many um, classes you obtained. I give you two, three minutes, something like that. You can uh, ask me questions if you wish. There is an answer in the chat. Rafael. Oh, let me see. Andre found three classes. Yeah, this is the answer. Can you tell us, uh, Andre, uh, what classes you found? I think I can. Uh say like A, B, D, uh, R are all from the same class. And then uh, B, it's longing in another class. And the other letters is another class. Yeah, exactly. This is it. You have three classes. The first one are the, the letters that are a, a circle, homotopy equivalent to circle. You have B alone, as you said. This is a, a, a space that is homotopy equivalent to the union of two circles, right? It has two holes. And then you have all the other contractible uh, letters. Thank you. Any question about that? All right. So let's continue. Um, we have defined topological spaces, continuous maps, uh, and our two um, equivalence relations, the homomorphism equivalence and the homotopy equivalence. I will now talk about uh, topological invariance. And I could introduce the, um, the problem like that. We have classified spaces in two groups, right? So let's say for the homotopy equivalence or homomorphism equivalence, these are the same questions. Human questions. Given a new space, X, that you are studying, how do I know in which class it belongs? This may be a complicated question. You have to find a homomorphism or to find a homotopy equivalence. Another question is, Given a class, given a group, uh, what are the uh, common characteristics? What are the common features of the spaces in this group, right? As we've seen this B here, it shares with the two circles, the, the fact that it has two holes, right? Um, this question could be uh, related to this uh, observation of uh, Poincaré, in this very nice book, uh, he said, math uh, is the art of giving the same name to different things, which is exactly what uh, we are doing here, right? Uh, I will introduce uh, today uh, four invariants, four uh, 
properties, four characteristics. The first one is embeddability. Um, say we have a topological space X. I say that X is embeddable uh, in Rn, the Euclidean space, so N is part of the definition. If there exists uh, a continuous injective map from X to Rn, right? What that means is that I am able to draw my space in the Euclidean space. For instance, the interval 0, 1, open here, but it can be closed, whatever, is embeddable in R because I can draw the interval in R. I can see the interval as a subset of R. So this is very easy. The circle is not embeddable in R, right? Uh, if I want to define a continuous a uh, map, the like injective continuous map, it's not possible. I will have to pass twice uh, on the same point. Now, I will give you the invariance property of uh, embeddability. It's a property that we will see uh, for every example. It is the main property that uh, it is maybe a definition that an invariance uh, uh, has. If two spaces X and Y are homomorphic, then either they are both embeddable, uh, either no one is embeddable into Rn and being fixed, right? So the property of being embeddable in Rn is a characteristic shared by all the spaces in the same uh, uh, homomorphism class. And we say that uh, being embeddable in Rn is an invariant of homomorphism class, right? This is very useful to show that two spaces are not homomorphic. If you can show that one is embeddable and the other one is not, then this proves that they are not in the same uh, homomorphism class. I can use that to prove a not so trivial fact that the cylinder and the Mobius strip are not homomorphic. They look alike, right? It's a, a strip like that. The Mobius strip I, I twisted before gluing. So to show that um, they are not homomorphic, I will embed one into R2 and show that the other one cannot be embedded in R2. And of course, the one that we embed in R2 is the cylinder, right? If I take my cylinder and I open it, I, I squash it like that uh, on the plane, what I get is an annulus a ring, right? So I have a, a well-defined uh, embedding of the cylinder in the plane in R2. Now I will prove that the mobile strip cannot be embedded in uh, R2. To do this, I will draw two circles on the Mobius strip. So you have to trust me, or to trust uh, this drawing, that these two circles here that I draw only intersect once at this point, right? Now, let's suppose, by contradiction, that I can embed the Mobius strip in R2. So this is an injective map. So in particular, what I obtain are two circles in R2, two closed curves that only intersect once. But well, you see, if, I mean, in the plane, if you enter the circle once, you have to go out. Otherwise, you cannot be closed. This is actually a consequence of the very strong uh, Jordan's theorem about closed curves in the plane. We conclude that this uh, embedding did not exist, and that these two spaces here are not homomorphic. All right?
um, L. Embodability is an invariant of homeomorphism classes, but not of homotopy classes, right? Uh, the cylinder and the uh, module strip are homotopy equivalent because I can I, I can both uh, I can retract both spaces into their inner circle. They are both homotopy equivalent to a circle. Uh, but, there is a there is a question once in the chat. Yeah. Let me see. Why cannot the circle just touch in one point? So I'm talking about um ah you mean um like the tangent. Um no, because um Why is it not possible? Mm. Because of the inversion of the one you. Sorry? For the inversion, no? I see at a certain point they have to be inver inverted, at least at the. Yeah, how to make this idea? The construction. <laughs> uh, They cannot be tangent at only one point. Um, yeah, right. It's not obvious. You, I, you, are there, you can. Are, they are tangent, tangent in all the points or the cross. They cannot be tangent in one point. This is. A... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not that obvious to, to, yeah, to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. To prove, yeah. You, you have to prove that uh, if, they, if they cross here, then you have to prove that, that here they also have to cross. It is not uh, enough to be tangent. So there is a reasoning. Uh, you're right. It's not, it's Le not obvious. Le Leonardo is giving you a, a hint. Yeah, let me see. So could we introduce the ideas of sides uh, of a circle in the surface? Not really because the mobile strip, it does not have one side, you know? The mobile strip, when you travel, uh, you end up on the opposite side. So I think it is more um, a question of... Um, Um, let's say you. Yeah, it's uh, uh, not. A, I cannot see it uh, directly, but there is a little thing to 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 prove. Yeah. Thank you for the um, next time. For next the time. <laughs> So, uh, embeddability is not an invariant of homotopy classes because, as I explained, both spaces here are uh, homotopy equivalent to circle, but only one of them is um, embeddable. Okay. Uh, ah, yeah, a little connection with uh, applications. So, if you, uh, you can think about the property of embeddability as uh, the problem of dimensionality reduction in the applications. Uh, so this comes from this very nice paper. You have uh, a cylinder in the, the, the three-dimensional space, and you want to project it in the, the plane, injectively, right? So you can see that uh, a few algorithms, famous algorithms, does not uh, respect the, the topological structure you had at the beginning, but these two algorithms in the end were able to squash, to, to right, uh, embed the cylinder in uh, the plane. Uh, let's talk about uh, 
and other invariants, the number of connected components. Um, I say that a topological space X is connected if for every pair of points, X and Y, uh, you can find a path between X and Y. What is a path? It's a continuous map from zero and to X, such that the uh, F0, the initial point is X, and the final point is Y. For instance, this space is connected because you can connect X and Y. This is not a connected space because in order to connect X and Y, you have to go out to exit the space. Uh, and so you cannot define this uh, continuous map. When your space is not connected, you can define its connected components, right? Uh, the connected components are the largest uh, connected subspaces of my space. For instance, this space X here has four connected components, right? These three disks and this line. And now the invariance property. If two spaces are homotopy equivalent, then they have the same number of connected components. So being uh, so uh, the, the number, number of connected components is an invariant of homotopy classes. Consequence, if two spaces are homomorphic, then they are homotopy equivalent and then they share the same number of connected components. And just as before, we can use this property to prove that two spaces are not homomorphic. For instance, the interval 0, 1 and the union of 0, 1 and 2, 3, uh, these spaces are not homomorphic, neither homotopy equivalent, because the first one has one connected component and the second one has two connected components. Uh, I can use this property also to show, as we said at the beginning, that the interval and the circle are not uh, homomorphic. How can I prove that uh, they both have one connected component? So we'll use a, a very nice construction. Uh, I will uh, prove this by contradiction. Let's suppose that these spaces are homomorphic, right? So I have a map F from uh, the interval to the circle, all right? Uh, a homomorphism. What I will do is pick a point X on this interval and look at its image, F of X, right? And now I will remove these points from the spaces. If I consider the restriction of F, I call it G. G is a map from uh, 0 to pi minus x and the circle minus f of x. And G is a restriction of a homomorphism. So this is still a homomorphism. You can prove this. But now look at these spaces. The interval minus a point. This is two intervals, right? And the circle minus a point. It's an open circle. Two intervals, this is two connected components. An open circle, it's one connected component. So what I did here is I defined a homomorphism between a space with two connected components and one connected component. This is impossible. Uh, and so by contradiction, the initial spaces are not homomorphic. All right. Uh, I have a question for you for the next uh, lesson in today's. I want you to prove that the interval, the semi-open interval and the open interval are not uh, homomorphic, right? Based on these same ideas uh, using the number of connected uh, components. Uh, 
a glimpse at uh, applications, uh, connected components, uh, this is related to the problem of uh, classification in data analysis. Say you have a data set like that, uh, any correct classifier would uh, find these two groups, right? These two clusters. Uh, what happens in, in TDA is that we think of these two clusters as uh, two connected components. We think of this point cloud as sampled on uh, uh, underlying space. This space is uh, made of two components. And so in the end, classifying uh, your data set is equivalent to uh, finding the connected components of the underlying uh, space, right? This is the general philosophy of, uh, of TDA. Um, I think I have only five minutes left. I will I will go quick on this. It can uh, be ten minutes. You know, we start later. So. Yeah. All right. Fine. Let's say ten minutes. Um, this is enough. So, another characteristic. Uh, this is Platon. Uh, these are the famous platonic solids, right? These polyhedra uh, share a very nice uh, property. If you take their number of faces, that you subtract the number of edges and you add the number of vertices, right? Four minus six, six plus four, it's equal to two. For all the polyhedra, this number here, is called the Euler characteristic. And he proved that in general, in any uh, polyed polyedron, convex polyhedron, this alternate sum will be equal to two, right? So there is some combinatorial uh, regularity uh, behind uh, polyhedron. What we like to do is to generalize this Euler characteristic uh, to any spaces, not only polyhedra, not only surfaces. And to do this, we need the notion of a simplicial complex. So simplicial complex, uh, I will use it a lot um, in the next lesson. So let me introduce it right now. Uh, simplicial complex is the, the object we use to encode uh, topological spaces on a computer, basically. It's a combinatorial structure. A generalization of a graph It's like that. You have a set V called the set of vertices. Um, a simplicial complex over V, it is a collection of subsets of V, all right? These subsets of V uh, are called simplices. And you have only one axiom, that if you have a simplex and a subset of this simplex, it must also be a simplex. Let me give you an example. Uh, the vertex set 0, 1, 2, uh, I define the simplicial complex K that is made of the singletons 0, 1, 2 and the pairs 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2. By convention, we use this um, square brackets and not the curly brackets. But to the simplices, but there are subsets. And so what is this? We can actually draw the simplicial complex. These singletons, we see them as uh, points, vertices, right? So I have zero, one, two. And the pairs, I see them as edges. I have the pair zero, one, the pair one, two, and the pair zero, two. So this simplicial complex encodes a triangle, right? Uh, by definition, the dimension of uh, a simplicial complex is the highest dimension of its simplices, and the dimension of a simplex is its cardinal minus one. So here the dimension is one. And uh, topologically, this triangle, this is a circle, right? 
so we encoded the circle as a combinatorial structure. Another example, uh, now have four vertices and I consider all the single tones, all the pairs and all the three tuples, right? This gives me a tetrahedron and a tetrahedron. This is topologically a sphere. So we can represent the sphere on the computer thanks to this simplicial complex. Now I can mimic the definition of the Euler characteristic. Um, I will say that the Euler characteristic of a uh, simplicial complex is its number of vertices minus its number of edges plus its number of triangle minus its number of uh, four tuples, etc. For instance, for the circle, the triangle, this is three minus three, zero. For our uh, tetrahedron, this is two, right? As we've seen it at the beginning. There is another question. We'd like actually to define the Euler characteristic, not for simplicial complexes, but for topological uh, spaces. In order to do that, uh, you have to use triangulations. So a triangulation of a topological space is a simplicial complex that is homomorphic to it, right? So if I take my, my circle, uh, I encode it as a triangle, and so I can define its Euler characteristic. There are some complications uh, with what I've wrote here because given the topological space, is the triangulation unique? Uh, does it actually admit the triangulation? We will uh, ask these questions uh, 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 next week. Um, the Euler characteristic uh, is something that indicates uh, uh, how many holes my space has, something like that. Uh, it's been used in the context of uh, um, the study of the cosmic web, right? The cosmic web, this is a very interesting uh, object because it can be seen as a one-dimensional object. If you see stars as, uh, uh, st if you see strings of star stars, this is a graph. It can be seen as an object of dimension two. It can be seen as an object of dimension three, uh, if you separate into galaxies. Uh, and understanding the topology of the cosmic web, this is an inter interesting question. What they have done here is they calculated the Euler characteristic of the, the cosmic web. This is actually, a, a famous topic in, in, uh, in TDA. More about that, uh, more about the cosmic web later uh, in this mini course. So I will uh, finish very quick with the Betty numbers. Uh, our last invariant. Um, given a topological space, you can define uh, a sequence of integers associated to this space, beta zero, beta one, beta two, etc. These integers are called the Betty numbers. The Betty numbers, they gather a lot of uh, information about the space. Uh, and their construction is not this simple. It's based on uh, the theory of homology that we will see uh, in two days. So instead of uh, defining it formally, I will show you how it looks uh, today. I took five uh, topological spaces and I wrote the first three Betty numbers. All right. Actually, it's not hard to, to uh, understand them. The first Betty number, beta zero, is equal to the number of connected components of the space. So all the four first spaces are uh, connected. So uh, one connected component. And so beta zero equals one. Except the last one, 
which is made of two circles. So this is two connected components, right? Beta one, this is the number of uh, holes uh, in my space. What is a hole? Basically a circle, right? This is the, the, the hole drawn by a circle. Uh, so these two circles here, tangent or not, they have two holes, right? The sphere does not have a hole. It has a void, right? A void being like the two-dimensional equivalent of a hole. Right. Um, another example, the torus. The torus has beta zero equals to one, right? It has one connect component. Beta two is equal to one because it has one void inside like a sphere. And beta one is equal to two because it actually has two inner circles, two independent uh, inner circles, right? That you can see here. Um, and we have, of course, the uh, invariance property that homotopy equivalent spaces uh, share the same Betty numbers, right? So this can be used again uh, to have an idea if two topological spaces belong to the same class. And it can help us to show that they are not in the same class. I think I will. Stop just is this example to finish uh, that really gives the 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 a taste of of TDA. Uh, this is a very famous paper. The authors study the space of natural images. So what they do, they take a huge collection of images and they extract three by three batches, right? Three by three little images. The images are uh, in gray scale. So in the end, the patch like that is simply a point in R9, right? The grayscale is between zero and zero and one. So you take a lot of images. You obtain a lot of points. This is a point cloud. And what they did, they computed uh, using TDA, the Betty numbers of this space, right? Of the underlying space. And what they found, are the following numbers, beta zero equals to one, beta one equals to two, and beta two equals to one. And then what we usually do when we see something like that is we think, well, I know spaces uh, that have these Betty numbers. What spaces do I know? Uh, the torus, right, we've seen, but the claim bottle also. The claim bottle, unfortunately, has the same Betty numbers as the torus. And the authors verified that the points actually lie on a clean bottle, an embedding of the clean bottle. And this uh, idea has been used later to design a clean, clean bottle based algorithms for uh, uh, image analysis. So this is it. We've seen today. Uh, basic notion of topology, uh, relations between topological space and how to understand the equivalence classes coming from these relations through the notion of uh, invariant. And this is it for today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, as always. So let's mm -hmm. thank uh, let's thank uh, Raphael. So open the microphone and join me. Okay. Thank you. So thank question, you. question, please. I'm sorry, I have, I have a question. Like I have two questions actually. Yes, please. please. Like uh, the first one, like regarding the. The Euler characteristic, because I mean, uh, is it a good measure also to, I mean, how, how useful is it as a, a measure of equivalence between two spaces? Because I mean, you, you talked that, uh, you said that um, the Euler characteristic of the circle is zero, right? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, the torus also has Euler characteristic equal to zero, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, this like, is... 
Whatever they mean, like well, because they're not equivalent. That yeah, yeah. No, this is a weak. This is a weak uh, uh, invariant compared to homology. Uh, homology will uh, help to discriminate discriminate between these two. But what is interesting with the other characteristic is that it's very simply defined. It's just mm -hmm. this uh, alternate sum. And mm -hmm. for instance, in the classification of surfaces, right? I I explained that they are classified by genus. Yes. Uh, actually, they are also classified by uh, their other characteristic. What I mean is that if you restrict your analysis to surfaces, then Euler characteristic is enough. Mm, I see. Okay. But in the in the whole world of topological spaces, and this is weak. Okay, I see. makes sense. And the other ones, like uh, when you talk about the bad numbers of the torus and the client bottle, yeah. So that I mean, they, they are, I mean, you can find a homotopy between them. No, no, no. no, no, no. The same way that uh, the circle and the torus have the same Euler characteristic but are not equivalent mm -hmm. the torus and the clean bottle have the same betty numbers but are not equivalent okay i see because i mean, I mean the the clean bottle is orientable right i believe or not it is not orientable yeah it's, it's not orientable okay then yeah that makes sense sure but you could i mean there are other invariants you could use actually we will uh study yeah with homology uh, next time we will be able to discriminate between these two uh, spaces okay so mm -hmm. that's fine well thanks thank you virginia asked for sorry virginia asked for um if my slides uh, will be available, they are already available on my uh, website. If you go, um, let me. If you go to rafeltinarage.github.io, and then you go to talks, and then today's talk, you can click on the on the slide. Right, and uh, of course, I will. Uh, you will have also the this uh, the recording. So. Uh, so yeah, it was very clear as you as usual. So any other question? It was so clear that I don't have more, more questions. <laughs> so we are very much looking forward for the next lecture on Thursday. Thank you so much, Rafael. And, Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I do remind you that Rafael is looking for a job, possibly in Rio, so <laughs> professor, they are online. <laughs> Take care, <laughs> good notes of this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rafael, very much. And see you no. next lecture. Bye-bye yeah. to everyone. Thank you.